when I was growing up, my favorite topic in school was always history. And my favorite history was, of course, American history. And my favorite area of American history was always America's original sin. The system of slavery. I found the period leading up to and after the Civil War more interesting, frankly, than the Revolutionary War. And I was fascinated by the Civil Rights Movement, by people rising up and trying to fulfill the promise of the victory of the Union in the Civil War, the ending of slavery. My very first research paper was in eighth grade, and it was on the desegregation of Nashville schools. And I went around interviewing um, students who were students in those days and wrote a paper about it. It probably wasn't until college that I really studied it in even more depth. I took courses in African-American history, learned about the Harlem Renaissance, read The Souls of Black Folk by W.B. Du Bois, learned all the details of, well, what Thurgood Marshall did and Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks. And... But my most interesting course in all of college was the historiography of Reconstruction. I don't think it was until I got to college that I even know that historiography existed. What was historiography? We all know history. History is what happened in the past. But historiography is more interesting, I've always found, than history. Historiography is the teaching of how history is taught throughout history. It's meta-history. And in fact, historiography, I think, tells you much more about the people teaching the history at the time than, well, the history of the time. So the history of the Civil War, the history of Reconstruction, has changed greatly throughout American history, just as our understanding of slavery has changed throughout. Right In the 1700s, it was taught that Africans were naturally inferior to white people. That wasn't what was taught in the 1600s. In the 1600s, Africans were indentured servants. Yes, they'd been taken as slaves from Portuguese slave ships, but it wasn't until 1640 or so that the first slavery case came to the Virginia courts. Back up, we all know in 1619, 401 years ago, the first representative assembly, English speaking in the New World, began the House of Burgesses, the Virginia House of Burgesses, where I still sit. We renamed it the House of Delegates, began in July of 1619. And it was only two months later, after celebrating the first representative democracy, English representative democracy in the New World, that we got America the first slaves from the Portuguese slave ship stolen by British pirates. Yin and yang, right? That's our American history. The good and the bad, founding principles two months apart. But in those first years, 1620s, 1630s, it wasn't exactly clear that there would be race-based slavery, right? There were indentured servants, black and white, uh, that served for a term of years. There were um, free blacks, and there were indentured whites. And it wasn't until John Punch, that case in 1640, where three indentured servants run away to Maryland and are captured and brought back to their master, I guess would be the word used. And the two white guys are punished with some whipping, extending their terms of indentured servitude. But John Punch, poor John Punch, the African among the bunch, well, he is sentenced to labor for life. The first legal documented slave in the United States. And even then, it was a little unclear for another couple decades, but by the 1660s, Virginia was already writing laws on slavery in the Virginia House of Burgesses. And by the 1670s and 80s, they were making clear it was race-based, that even children of indentured servants would, excuse me, children of slaves would be slaves. They would not be indentured servants. They wouldn't be born free if they were of African heritage. And this entire race-based structure starts building up until, by the 1700s, of course, Virginia is the center 
of slavery in the United States, the main state for slaves, and a lot of our vicious practices spread throughout the South. But look, there's a lot of history there. It's really interesting. I want to move on to the Civil War because there was no doubt at the time of the Civil War why the Southern states were seceding from the Union. The issue was slavery. Every single Southern state had in their Articles of Secession the right of people to own other people. It was part of our Constitution, right? It was the Dred Scott decision. The right to own someone else. It was systemic. It is part of the system. The first Constitution, as we know, counted slaves as three-fifths of a white person, not to give them three-fifths of a vote, mind you, of course not, but to allow slave owners to have more power and slave states to have more power than non-slave states. Another thing I've always found interesting is that only one quarter or so of white people, even in the South, even owned slaves. Three quarters of white people were too poor to own slaves, which is really fascinating when you think about the fact that a lot of the people, the Confederate soldiers, were fighting and dying not for their right to own and mistreat others, but for the right of rich white people to own and mistreat and cruelly treat others. But I digress. I really can talk about this for a long time. I, I find it fascinating, still do. But moving on, the Civil War was fought, the South lost, and Union troops occupied southern states and required them to have governments that actually allow blacks to vote for a decade or two. That's the period of Reconstruction. Reconstruction, again, learned a lot of this back in my course in college. It was seen as a heroic thing to the Republicans, who were, of course, the party of Lincoln, the party that freed the slaves, 1860s and 1870s. Uh, seen as a preposterously dark time to racist Southerners in the 1880s, 90s, 1900s, 1920s, as they discuss the ridiculousness of blacks sitting in the legislature and actually having political power. And you see, by teaching Reconstruction as an evil time, the South could justify their current practices of Jim Crow and lynching, and segregation, and keeping blacks from voting. So the history of history is very important to history. How the white Southerners treated their past was used in their present to mistreat in their present. Right after the Civil War, there was, I mean, right after the Civil War, late 1860s, there was a time when the country tried to come together again. People like Robert E. Lee said there should be no statues to Confederate leaders. There should be no war statues because that just causes animosity to continue. On that, I agree with Robert E. Lee. Don't agree so much, or at all, obviously, to the things we don't talk about with Robert E. Lee, like how much he enjoyed beating his slaves when they escaped, or how he refused to free them, even though he promised to. Those parts aren't talked very much. And that's part of the historiography of Robert E. Lee. After the war, it was very important to the South to rehabilitate Robert E. Lee, to rehabilitate Jefferson Davis, who was seen as a scoundrel, even by the South, largely, right after the Civil War. But the reason why the South was rehabilitating these racist Confederate leaders, people like Nathan Bedford Forrest, who formed the Ku Klux Klan, was in order to justify their oppression in their day. The vast majority of monuments and statues to the Civil War, they weren't made in the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s. No, they were made in the 1890s, around the time that Plessy v. Ferguson established that separate could be fine as long as it was equal into the 1900s, 19-teens, as Jim Crow laws are set up in southern state after southern state, into the 1920s, when the Ku Klux Klan was at its zenith in 1924, tens of thousands of robed Klansmen were marching in the streets of Washington, D.C. 
this was the time when we see these memorials. And they're set up purposely to oppress. They really aren't about the Civil War at all. Very strong Civil War general, General Longstreet. Very strong Confederate general, right? He wasn't remembered very much because he, after the war, became a Republican and worked to heal the nation and didn't believe in so much racial oppression. He didn't get a statue in his name. No, these statues were designed for their time, and their time was not the Civil War. Their time was 1900, 1920. Again, many of them came into fashion in the 1950s, in the times of massive resistance, Brown versus Board of Education, white people resisting treating black people as equal, going to school with black kids. Indeed, you want to know where the birth of that Civil War flag is? The Confederate, the thing we call the Confederate flag? Largely the 1950s. Look it up. It may surprise some of you folks. You want to know what the Confederate flag was? It wasn't this thing with the stars and the bars looking like the Scottish flag. No. That was used by the Army of Northern Virginia in a few limited campaigns. I guess people like the design and think it's cool. But the main Confederate flag was a much more boring affair. It changed a few times throughout the Civil War. Basically, it was the circle of stars that you see in the early Revolutionary War flags of the United States because there were supposedly 13 southern states. There were really only 11 in the Confederacy, but they included Kentucky and Missouri. Too much detail. But the heart of it was a circle of 13 stars and three bars, stars and bars, red, white, red, instead of the 13 stripes, the American flag. In fact, they confuse a lot of them on the battlefield. No, it was in the 1950s when they brought back that snazzy Army of Northern Virginia Confederate flag and proclaimed that the American flag, and that became the symbol of the South and of racism. It was brought back specifically in opposition to desegregation. So we see that history can be used to oppress. That the way we teach history, the historiography, can be used to oppress. That teaching the South as this mythical lost cause of these gallant people fighting for those women at home in petticoats as they gallantly lost their war. That wasn't really about slavery, it was about states' rights. And then all the blacks came home and wanted to be with their masters again. Well, you can see that lost cause. You can just watch Gone with the Wind. Great movie. False history. But that kind of teaching was used to, behind the scenes, lynch black people. Keep them from voting. Keeping them from decent education. Keeping black Americans from decent jobs. To promote white supremacy... Wrong history was taught. Let's never forget the first talking film, the first talkie, was Birth of a Nation. An incredibly racist, horrible film that portrays reconstruction. Portrays black people on horses raping women and the gallant Ku Klux Klan fighting the evil Negro. I don't remember what they called them in the film. fake history. And yet, Birth of a Nation is our nation's first talking, our first film, our nation's first film. I think the first talking film was The Jazz Singer, a guy in blackface. And then one of the great first films in color, Gone with the Wind. Yes, this pervades American history. Other parts of our history are not taught. The Tulsa Race Massacre, when white people were upset that a number of black people were getting into middle class, some even into upper middle class in Tulsa. There were doc black doctors and lawyers, black Wall Street. They were doing well. So the white people went on whatever you want to call it, a pogrom, genocide, massacre. They went out and they burned the black businesses to the ground, killing hundreds, 99 years ago. Side point, the President of the United States is going to Tulsa some 99 years after 
this. Let's see if he mentions it. But that part of history wasn't taught. The part about the genocide Native Americans, not so much taught. Right? We, we want to talk about George Washington, our hero, the first president. We don't want to talk about how he treated his slaves or Jefferson or his dalliance with Sally Hemings and Andrew Jackson, particularly cruel to slaves. It's never fun to talk about the ugly parts of our history. So when we gallantly show people fighting for slavery on their horses, that's a problem. We don't normally show traitors and enemies of the United States in statues and monuments, right? There are no monuments that I'm aware of to Benedict Arnold. I don't know of any monuments to um, Germany in World War I or World War II in the United States. Can't recall any monuments to North Vietnam here in the 70s. We don't usually celebrate the people that try to tear America apart. And of course, the Civil War was the greatest killing in American history. More people died in the Civil War than all our wars put together. These monuments are not about the Civil War at all. These monuments are about the time in which they were put up. They're really about Jim Crow. They're about segregation. They're about lynching. They're about propping up white supremacy. As such, they're a very interesting part of our history. It's just fake history and yet part of our history. So maybe you can see why I have complex feelings about tearing these statues down. I don't think they should be hidden. I don't think they should be destroyed. In Alexandria, we used to have a plaque. It was a plaque on what was then the Hotel Monaco, now it's the Alexandria. It's the Marshall House. It was a plaque on the first real deaths of the Civil War. Very historic place, right in the middle of Old Town Alexandria. A few people died at Fort Sumter in the celebrations, but actual shooting in the Civil War began a mile from my house at the Marshall House. There, and again, I think history is fascinating. I won't go into the whole story, but basically Union troops invaded. Uh, the Union soldiers saw a Confederate flag flying from the top of the Marshall House. The innkeeper there was, of course, a strong Confederate sort of supported Virginia secession. The Union soldiers ran up, grabbed the Confederate flag, tore it down from the pole, were cut down the steps when the owner of the inn shot the gallant, well, the Union soldier, carrying the, clutching the Confederate flag dead in the stairway. The Union second in command then shoots the innkeeper dead on the stairway. They're both dying. Pretty dramatic, actually. One Southerner, one Northerner one Union supporter, one Confederate soldier, right there at the Marshall House. It's an interesting story. It should be told. It's the first real shots of the Civil War. But even more interesting to me, at least, than that incredible historic thing that happened at the Marshall House was the plaque that the United Daughters of the Confederacy placed outside the Marshall House. I used to show it to people when I took my Old Town tours. And the plaque said something to the effect of, here a... Southerner Jackson died gallantly defending his property against Union thieves. I don't remember the exact words, but it was very much something like that. A very one-sided story. They don't happen to mention the property was a Confederate flag, a flag being flown in opposition to the United States. But that one-sided history, that fake news, that historiography is history. And so I was very disappointed when the management of the hotel changed from Monaco to Alexandria and they took the plaque down. That's not the right way to go about it. My view was always there should be a new plaque right next to the old plaque with an arrow pointing at the old plaque saying, isn't this ridiculous? Here's the true story of what happened at the Marshall House. And now look at how the United Daughters of the Confederacy would put up propaganda to teach that history wrong. That's, that would have been really cool. I always wanted that to happen. I feel the same way about the Confederate statues now. I don't advocate destroying them, but I also don't advocate leaving them up on their pedestal. We put things up on a pedestal that we praise, that we honor, 
And the purpose of putting these Confederate generals up on statues was specifically to oppress black Americans. That was the purpose. That's why they were put up. They weren't put up right after the Civil War. They were put up specifically to defend Jim Crow, systemic racism, white supremacy. And so I understand why so many black and white Americans want them to come down. And I think they should come down. But I want to put them in a museum. I want them to be remembered, those statues. Because I don't want to paper over the historiography any more than I want to paper over the history. America should know about the myth of the lost cause because they should know how Southerners tried to change their own history, downplay slavery, downplay the brutality of the Civil War in order to encourage brutality in their own times. So yes, these statues do belong in a museum where we can give them full context, where we can tell the story. All this is to say that when I look at these statues, I want to tell the entire history. I have fought to tell all of America's history, particularly here in Alexandria, where we have so much history. Alexandria is not just the place where the French and Indian War was planned and where George Washington had a townhouse and he and Robert E. Lee went to the same church. That's, that's all true. It's also the place where we had the largest slave trading outfit in the United States. The second largest slave market right in Old Town. It's where the slavery trail of tears began. And we need to talk about the slavery trail of tears. We need to know that the slaves were sold in Old Town and families were split and brutally torn apart by these slave traders right there on Duke Street. And then the slaves were marched down Duke Street in coffles with these, which is, they had, they were chained together with these heavy chains around their neck, two by two, and marched all the way down to New Orleans. They were marched out Duke Street and then Little River Turnpike. And then what is today 66? Those roads were used by the Slavery Trail of Tears, which was 12 times the Native American Trail of Tears, down I-81 into Tennessee, put on boats, put on boats on the Tennessee River, and then Cumberland were brought to down the Mississippi River to New Orleans where they were sold to the New South. That's a story that's not told very often. It needs to be told in Alexandria. And we need, and I've been promoting and I've supported uh, getting enough budget for our Alexandria Slavery Museum right there on Duke Street. We should have an internationally renowned, and I think we will, museum talking about the slave trade, talking about its brutality, not at all hiding the cruelty that occurred right here in Alexandria. And even in that time, even when you study the 1840s, you see that the slavers tried to hide their own brutality. They had those pretty houses on Duke Street, and they had a nice fancy room where they would go in and treat their guests as if it were some beautiful antebellum plush townhouse and not the greatest slave jail. My point is we need to tell all of our history. And when we take these statues down, we need to put them in museums so that people know not just the history, but the historiography, not just what happened, but the fake news that was taught at the time it happened, how the slavers themselves tried to hide their brutality, how the South, by trying to build up the generals of the Civil War, were using it to put down black folk. And yet it's critical that America not be seen as supporting that. We can't leave them up on a pedestal because people might think that those are our values. And of course, they're not. Not for the vast majority of us, those are not our values. It's tricky to teach historiography. It's tricky to teach historical lies. I saw HBO was taking down Gone with the Wind. We shouldn't take down Gone with the Wind. We should contextualize it. 
People need to understand why that movie was made in 1939, what it meant at that time, and why it was important to create a false history. You know, we need to show Mein Kampf as well. We shouldn't hide Hitler's autobiography, but we should put it in the proper context. We shouldn't let a bunch of neo-Nazis have the book and celebrate it as truth. No, we need to put context around it, explain why this madman was writing these awful things and how, well, the underpinnings of the Holocaust began. So let's teach evil. Let's remove the statues. I actually had the first bill um, in Virginia to remove our statue of Robert E. Lee from Statuary Hall in the United States Capitol. Every state gets two statues. Ours is George Washington and Robert E. Lee. And I don't think Robert E. Lee was the second greatest Virginian that ever lived. I'm proud to say that my bill, uh, incorporated into Jerron Ward's bill, was ha very happy to let her carry it, passed the House and was signed into law by the governor. We're going to have a commission to take down, um, to discuss how to take down and who to replace Robert E. Lee with in the United States Capitol. I also introduced a law to allow localities to determine what to do with Confederate memorials, including allowing Alexandria to move the Appomattox statue that used to be on the corner of Prince and Washington Street. So the United Daughters of the Confederacy took it down. They were afraid it would be destroyed. I would like to see it in a museum or on the, the, the lawn of the Lyceum, which is a museum, off its pedestal, but in proper context, talking about why it was put up and what that meant for the Alexandrians of the late 1880s who put it up. But it was, I put forward legislation to allow us to take these things down because it's vitally important that Americans understand that that does not represent us. At the same time, I hope I've made it clear that I think we need to teach not just history, but historiography. We need to teach how history has been taught throughout the ages. And there's no clearer example of that than these Confederate memorials. They need to come down. They need to be put properly in their own dustbin of history as we move on to replace the statues with those people that we, as Virginians and as Americans, hold dear today. And you might say that's just symbols. They're only symbols. True. But a symbol's a really powerful thing. Right? We pledge allegiance to the flag and the republic for which it stands. Symbols are powerful things. The swastika, very powerful symbol. Indeed, it was largely these statues as symbols that justified cruelty, lynching, Jim Crow, segregation. So we still have a lot of work to do. We need police reform. We need to keep raising the minimum wage and provide jobs and housing and give people a chance to have a decent education. There's all these things that have yet to do. I don't mean to say that taking down statues is going to suddenly heal all the racial ills in our society. But it's a start. It shows what we stand for. And I appreciate it if you've taken the time to listen to my little discourse today. This is Delegate Mark Levine. Uh, feel free to comment and let me know what you think.